The ex-president's legal team responding just minutes ago before today's 5 p.m. deadline to special counsel Jack Smith's motion for a protective order, arguing uh, to narrow the proposed order to, quote, shield only genuinely sensitive materials from public view. The request came because the prosecution felt compelled to ask Judge Tanya Chutkin to prohibit the defendant, uh, the, here in this case, the former president, from publicly disclosing evidence gathered during their investigation. The protective order motion apparently not enough to deter the ex-president from making more problematic public comments uh, throughout the weekend, as we saw, and even today. He attacked Judge Chutkin, the former vice president, Mike Pence, and, of course, the special counsel, Jack Smith. Uh, this breaking news is where we start this hour. Former acting assistant attorney general for national security at the U.S. Department of Justice, Mary McCord, is here. Editor at large for the Bulwark, Charlie Sykes. Plus, with me here on set, Maya Wiley. She's a former assistant U.S. attorney, now the president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Um, and just to start off, you know, we are getting this document just a few minutes ago. We were expecting it to be on time. I guess courts operate that way. So we got it a little bit early, but right uh, before it struck five. Um, I know we're still going through the document, but I don't know if you've had a chance to, to kind of glance at it and the conclusion, the summary of what the argument that Trump team, the Trump's team is making here in, in terms of why they don't want this protective order. Yeah, and look, I haven't been all the way through this document, as you point out, Eamon, but what is clear is, first of all, they're conceding there can be a protective order. Mm. This is not a blanket response that says you can't stop him from talking at all uh, about, the, you know, so we agree that there can be some, thank you, some yep. protection, but... Uh, at the same time, they're arguing that it should be limited to what they're calling sensitive materials. So haven't read the exhibit to say what they think those are and are not. Uh, but secondly, and I think kind of strikingly, trying to make sure that they can share information even with people they are not paying as part of the defense. And, you know, that's a big red flag to me because think about it this way. Rudy Giuliani is an attorney. Well, if Trump isn't paying him for legal counsel, but they say we're going to treat him as part of our defense, even though he's an unindicted co-conspirator, you can see many problems with why that might be concerning. So you have to ask yourself, who is it that they want to share material with who they are not paying as part of the defense? And we are just getting here, as I mentioned, uh, the printout of the indictment, 29 pages. Uh, going through it in real time to get a sense of what uh, the response is from Team Trump. But, Mary, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, but one of the main things you see right there on page one, or at least certainly on um, point A, if you will, in the argument from Trump's team, is they say uh, that the proposed protective order is overbroad, um, basically saying that it just covers way too much information and they want to narrowly define it specifically to Maya's point about uh, some of the sensitive information that may be revealed throughout this. Really, it seems, and I have just gotten this, and so I have barely, barely even skimmed. I've really looked at right. the headings, but I can tell enough from the headings that this is really sort of a, a, an extension of the argument that they've been making sort of in public through the through the former president's social media posts and along with his own attorney's appearances on multiple television shows over the weekend, which is this First Amendment argument, right? I mean, the argument over the weekend is this is just a First Amendment case. This is a case that's trying to, leave, trying to penalize the former president for exercising his First Amendment rights. And this uh, response to the motion for the protective order is basically, if you issue this protective order, this will infringe on the president's First Amendment rights. He has a right to speak about this case, and he should be able to speak about um, documents that are provided in discovery that don't, if, at least to the extent that they don't contain sensitive information, which, as you were just discussing, they want to divide, define even more narrowly than the government would define that. So I think this this First Amendment theme is already in just, you know, we haven't even been a week since the charges is a major, major theme of everything that they're going to be doing to defend this case. Yeah, and, and, and to Mary's point, and you kind of, kind of, you, you read between the lines here to, to get a broader 
sense of what the defense strategy for Trump might be. And it does actually say it here when you look at uh, page two, Maya. It, it, this is, again, Trump's team that is writing this. They're making this, and this is what they write. In a trial about First Amendment rights, the government seeks to restrict First Amendment rights. Worse, it does so against its administration's primary political opponent during an election season in which the administration, prominent party members, and media allies have campaigned on the indictment and proliferated its false uh, allegations. Well, first of all, Mary is completely right. And what we're really seeing is a political weaponization of the First Amendment, because we're seeing it become something that is well and far beyond what it traditionally is conceived of. Because look, you know, we've talked about this before, and Andrew, I think, made this point earlier with you, Eamon, about Mr. Loro's laying out the defense tactics here. And it was very much to kind of suggest that there are no limits to the First Amendment, that you can actually hide behind it in order to commit crime if you take it to its logical extension. I mean, Mr. Laura would not say that he was arguing that, but I think in, in essence, they are using this process as much as possible to also talk to the electorate, particularly their base, and try to ensure that they're understanding this case in the way they want them to understand it. And frankly, it's not a complete or thorough or fair discussion about the Constitution or our laws. Charlie, if you thought that this was not going to be about politics, think again, because it's clear from just skimming through this right now over the last couple of minutes that the defense is intending on making politics front and center. Again, I'm going to read an excerpt from page four. Um, against this backdrop, the government requests the court assume the role of censor and impose content-based regulations on President Trump's political speech that would forbid him from publicly discussing or disclosing all non-public documents produced by the government, including both uh, purportedly and sensitive materials. Uh, again, they, and, and in this document, they make reference to uh, thinly veiled comments by other political uh, uh, players talking about the indictment, and they are now making the argument that President Trump's, if this protective order was granted, President Trump's hands would be tied in the political arena, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, to Andrew Weissman's point, um, they're making arguments that may fly in the court of public opinion, or at least among Republican uh, primary voters, um, less likely to be successful in court, because, of course, all conspiracies involve speech, all acts of fraud involve speech, uh, uh, intimidation um, involves speech. Um, what is really striking to me, though, is this, is just pull back the lens just a little bit is the fact that last Thursday, the federal magistrate uh, very pointedly told Donald Trump, you know, do not uh, try to uh, intimidate or uh, intimidate or influence uh, jurors or, or, or potential witnesses. And, and what does Donald Trump do within 24 hours? He puts out a, a tweet, if you come after me, I'm going to come after you. He goes full mob boss, full thug. And it fell in the weekend as if he was almost trying to dare or bait the judge into taking some action that would uh, be able to, uh, you know, in, in enhance his ability to play the martyr card here. He wants to be able to say, look, I am the victim. They are gagging me. They are silencing me. And so, you know, it is interesting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the judge responds to this. This is not part of this particular motion. But um, how far will the judge be willing to let Donald Trump go in using social media or his bully platform to go after and attack the prosecutors, insult the judge, um, insult the jury pool, um, and 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 as he has so often in the past, um, uh, intimidate intimidate potential witnesses here. Uh, he, he, you know, he, she doesn't have to throw him in jail. But it would be interesting, and I'd be interested to hear the other uh, lawyers on the panel comment on this. It would be interesting for the judge to call Donald Trump and his lawyers into the court and say, "Can you explain what you mean by this? These these threats, uh, your your threats of retribution, and why I should not regard this as an act of contempt of court." It would be interesting to have Donald Trump have to explain that to a federal judge who's presiding over his felony case.
Um, Mary, let me read for you an interesting passage here from uh, page nine. It's uh, headlined Other Disputed Revisions, and it's kind of revealing, uh, and, and we'll get into it in a second. But part of it reads, despite the extraordinarily limited time President Trump had to prepare this response, we attempted to confer with the government in good faith over the weekend by sending our proposed revisions and arranging multiple phone calls. Setting aside our general dispute regarding the treatment of non-sensitive documents, we had hoped the government would engage with us in a collaborative dialogue aimed at fashioning mutually agreeable language for numerous procedural and def uh, definitional clauses in the proposed order. Unfortunately, the government declined a cooperative approach, refusing to provide any real-time feedback. Ultimately, just hours before our deadline, the government notified Defense Council it would oppose most of our revisions. Although time limitations prevent us from fully uh, explicating every proposed edit. We address several significant issues below. Once again, we believe it would be beneficial to set a hearing on this matter such that the parties may fully discuss each red line in sequence and address any concerns the court may have. Uh, that is a lot of uh, uh, legal language. Give us the common sense or the common version of that for most of us who don't speak lawyer. I think there's a couple of things going on there in what you read. One is that they are still bickering with the government about uh, who is failing to cooperate with who. You know, when the government came in with its motion for the protective order on Friday night, it explained that it had originally proposed one on Tuesday, the day even before, I'm sorry, Wednesday, August the 2nd, the day before arraignment, hadn't heard back from the defense attorneys until Friday, two days later. And so therefore they felt like they needed to come into court with their motion. Uh, when the defense attorneys on Saturday asked for an extension to oppose the pr protective order, um, they claimed that the government hadn't been willing, essentially, to engage, to engage with them and, and confer. And the government responded saying, yes, we have. So we are going back and forth with who is being playing nicely in the sandbox and who isn't. Um, and I think that's part of what they're trying to suggest, that they have actually were, were the ones being magnanimous here and that the government was not responding in real time. And I, I expect the government will respond to that, if not in writing, uh, orally when they're before the court. Um, the other thing they're trying to do is really, really pick apart this proposed protective order with red lines and get the court to, again, delay things, I think, by getting the court to hold a hearing on this and go paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, and entertain argument about each provision of what really should be a pretty standard protective order. And I think this is part of the delay tactic. They're again re requesting a hearing on something that really shouldn't require a hearing. These protective orders, the first one the government proposed was based on one they had agreed to in the Mar-a-Lago case. The second one was based on one that a Trump-appointed judge, Judge Carl Nichols, had actually issued in another case. So these are not things the government was making up. They're things that are pretty standard. And I think this is really a delay tactic. Tactic. And the third thing I would say is not specific to the portion that you read, but I think is uh, related to this motion as a whole. And again, I haven't, or this opposition as a whole, and I haven't read the whole thing, but it seems to fail to acknowledge that Mr. Trump is now the defendant in an ongoing criminal proceeding. And they're treating this as though he is still just an ordinary citizen candidate um, whose rights cannot be restricted at all. And that's not just not the way it works in the criminal law. Rightly or wrongly, the law provides for on a showing of the requisite predicate cause, um, there can be restrictions on people. There can be restrictions on their liberty. Many, many uh, defendants in criminal cases end up detained pretrial. There can be restrictions on their speech. And I think that's something that Mr. Trump and his attorneys so far are not really acknowledging. <laughs>